Hello everyone, welcome back to our second to last lecture for Geography 101, Earth Systems. Today we're going to be talking all about paraglacial topography. So these are areas uh, where we have receded glaciers. So paraglacial landscapes are areas where a glacier has retreated, leaving exposed areas, often with lots of permafrost. Uh, so we're going to talk about the type of landscape features that can develop in this type of new landscape that develops as glaciers retreat. So one of the most notable of these features are U-shaped valleys. So glaciers like to carve out sediment um, and erode a lot of sediment away. And as a result, they can produce these very wide, steep wall um, valleys like you see in Yosemite Valley here, compared to these very um, steep, narrow valleys like you see in river channels that form V-shaped channels. So glaciers form U-shaped channels, rivers form V-shaped channels. Um, and so when these U-shaped um, channels get filled with water, we can have a fjord. So this is a fjord in uh, Norway that I took a photo of. And so um, a fjord is a narrow, long, steep walled inlet formed by a glacier valley filling with seawater. So usually when you have a tidewater glacier, a glacier that terminates in the ocean, and that glacier then recedes, then the um, part of that the glacial valley will be um, below sea level um, and will be filled with water. Um, additionally, um, when you can have large number of glaciers retreating, you have sea level rise, just as we see with climate change. And so as the sea level rises, more of that glacial valley um, can be filled with water. Um, and so repeated um, erosional events from um, lots of glaciers carving out that valley can mean that um, large portions of that, uh, that valley can be filled with water. And so as a result, a lot of paraglacial um, areas, especially if they're um, near the ocean, um, will have extensive fjord networks. Um, for glaciers that end on land, though, um, instead of fjords, we get lakes. So um, proglacial lakes are lakes that are in front of a glacier, um, but we can also have paraglacial lakes that are further away from the glacier um, in previously retreated glacial landscapes. Um, and we can also have um, paternoster lakes. So these are a series of lakes in a line um, that form behind each of the recessional moraines. Remember, we talked about moraines previously when we talked about glaciers. They're the, the kind of crescent-shaped um, uh, glacial deposits of sediment um, that result uh, from that sediment from the glacier um, getting pushed out towards the terminus, or at least uh, terminal moraines are. And so the, those crescent-shaped um, sediment deposits can form lakes behind them. And then each of the recessional moraines behind the terminal moraine can cause a lake as well. And so you can have a series of lakes all leading back to the glacier that you can see here um, in Greenland. So those are proglacial and paternoster lakes. Next, we have drumlins. Um, drumlins are very cool features that you can see um, all throughout um, different landscapes. So they're airfoil shaped deposits of glacial till. Um, so this is, I think, in England. Um, so where we had um, the Ice Age cover parts of northern um, UK uh, with ice. And so we have some remnants of that in drumlins. So drumlins form when a glacier is flowing over a particularly resistant rock um, that is not being eroded, um, and you have glacial deposits of till behind it. So as the glacier moves, um, it hits this bedrock feature, um, and it can't erode it away, and instead um, the kind of uh, resistance to flow caused by this bedrock will cause glacier till to be deposited behind it. Um, and you have this tail of the drumlin um, 
mostly filled with sediments, um, whereas the front of the drumlin um, will be mainly bedrock. Um, and so you can always look at a, a drumlin and know that the steep side of the drumlin is where the glacier was flowing into, and then the long side of the drumlin is um, pointing away from that glacier. Next, we have eskers. Eskers are linear glacial deposits formed from sediment um, depositing within subglacial channels. Remember, we talked about um, subglacial channels and Rothstrom channels um, or Rothesburg channels. Um, so eskers are the result of those channels after um, the glacier is retreated. So um, you can imagine this being an entire um, subglacial channel that then got plugged and then filled with sediment slowly. Um, and then as the glacier retreated, all that was left was this line of sediment. Um, you can see that in this diagram here. You have this subglacial channel um, where you have um, sediment from the glacier moving through this, this stream um, and then slowly depositing. And then as the glacier retreats, um, all that's left is that linear feature. Next, we have came and kettle topography. Um, so this is really um, prominent, especially in newly exposed um, glacial landscapes. And it's one of the reasons why periglacial regions have so many lakes. Um, so a kettle pond is a pond formed by a chunk of dead ice embedded in sediment um, as the glacier retreats. So dead ice is just ice that's not moving. Um, it's been disconnected from the glacier and it's just sitting there until it melts away. Um, but that ice can be so large that it displaces a large amount of sediment. Um, and then eventually when it gets melted, um, it'll form a depression like this one um, took a photo of in Denali National Park, um, the Toklat uh, River Gorge. Um, and so when this, um, there used to be a block of ice here, and then that melted away and left just a depression um, that was filled with water. And that is called a kettle pond or kettle lake. Um, additionally, um, we can have cames. So cames um, are kind of the opposite, where kettles um, or where there is an excess of ice um, as the glacier retreated, um, cames form when there was a lack of ice as the glacier retreated. Um, and so there's a hole in the ice. And so that hole in the glacier allowed sediment to drop in um, and deposit. Um, either um, it was a moulin or a crevasse um, or just a differential flow path that allowed more sediment to get blown in or fl uh, flow um, from the top of the glacier into this hole. And then as this glacier retreats, that um, deposit of sediment remains, leaving this mound um, or this came. And so, so that's how cames are formed. Next, we have pingos. So pingos are um, cool features um, in um, areas where you have lots of permafrost, um, usually discontinuous permafrost, so layers of permafrost that are not uniform throughout the entire area. And when that happens, um, you can have groundwater flowing through the open areas of the permafrost um, when you have an artesian well. And so when the temperature is cold enough, as the water flows upwards from that artesian well through the discontinu uh, discontinuity in the permafrost, then an ice lens forms. So as the water um, gets uh, pushed up, you have more freezing occurred, occurring. And because um, ice takes up more space than water, um, then you have frost heaving um, and the soil above it being thrust upwards. Um, and as a result, you can have mounds develop um, above these ice lenses that are several meters to 70 meters tall um, as a result. And you can see those here. Additionally, pingos can be formed um, from lakes as um, water from a lake seeps into the ground and you have advancing permafrost, um, so cooling conditions 
then the water that seeped into the ground then freezes um, and forms an ice lens that then um, heaves the ground upwards and forms a mound. So those are the two different um, types of pingos that can form. An open system pingo um, formed from discontinuous permafrost with an artesian well, and a closed system pingo um, formed from a lake with advancing permafrost. And then the last thing that we're going to be talking about today are pulses. Pulses are very similar to pingos, um, but instead they are um, characterized by um, layered ice lenses. So pulses are mounds formed in boggy permafrost regions by successive freezing of annual water layers. So you can see here the process that goes on. Um, in a boggy region, when you have uh, some area that doesn't have as much snow cover in the winter, um, so maybe the wind blew snow away from that region, um, then that region will have more melting occurring because there's less insulation from the snow. And that uh, melting will then turn into an ice lens. Um, and that ice lens will um, thrust that soil a little bit higher up and again, um, because of that prominence, you will have uh, less snow cover developing there, and you have a repeat event here as you have melt infiltrating in, as well as flowing in from the ground, and freezing and forming ice lenses, and you have successive layers of these ice lenses that can um, build up and form a mound as a result. Um, and so you'll um, if you were to dig into this pulsa, um, like you can see here, then you would um, see this layers of soil, ice, soil, ice, and so on, um, until it finally collapses and you can form a lake. So that just about covers it. So today we talked about U-shaped and V-shaped valleys. We talked about fjords. We talked about um, proglacial and paternoster lakes drumlins, eskers, kettle and cane topography, and then lastly, pingos and pulses. So thanks everyone for watching. I hope you learned something, um, and I will see you guys next time. All right.